Second Peter chapter 1, and uh, tonight I want to just finish up this thing on faith, but boy, I mean to tell you what, how could, how could you ever preach out the subject of faith? I mean, there's no way to get your arms around it all. Faith is just a huge, huge subject, but because it was there, and uh, you know the way that that precious faith, it just uh, stuck out to me, it seemed like this morning. But I want us to read just a little bit further and, and uh, get into it tonight again. Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of, our, of Jesus Christ our Lord, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be, you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Lord, we pray tonight you'd help us to preach in a way that would glorify your name and honor the Word of God. In Jesus' name, amen. I hope that you notice those words, precious promises. And we said this morning that faith is an investment in the, the divine promises of the Word of God. And I don't know about you, but I just hope as the years go by that I can more, have more faith to trust the Lord about every issue of life. Seem like, you know, some things I do pretty good in and other things I don't do so well at. We just need to really get to where we just look at the Word of God and if God has promised that, if God has said that, you know, uh, there's a, let me give you a scripture. It is God that worketh in you both to will and to do of His good pleasure. That's a promise of God. It is God that worketh in you both to will and to do of His good pleasure. God is working in your life. Even when you're not interested, when it don't seem like nothing's happening, God's still working in your life. And he's working all things together for good to them that love the Lord and the called according to his purpose. And if we just learn to invest in the promises of God, and I want to give you just three or four examples tonight of people that did. Number one, Noah invested in the divine promises of God. Now, what were those promises? God had promised the world that he was going to bring a flood, that he was going to destroy it. But God had also promised that if he'd build an ark, he'd save him. And Noah invested in that word of God. Noah invested in that promise. Now, when I say that word invest, I want, it's more than just when you think about investing something monetarily. I'm talking about that he invested 120 years of his life into the promise of God. And if you'll take that whole concept tonight and just think about it and move it, th- move it forward and think about investing your life in the promises of God. I'm telling you something, you'll have a life that you won't have to look back and regret about either because it'll be a life, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Noah invested his life in the divine promises of God. There's another man that invested his life is Abram. God promised Abraham a land. And Abraham left Ur of Chaldees. You know what he did when he left? He was investing his life in the promise of God. He said, I've got a promise from God. I've got something from the Word of God, and I'm going to move on it. I'm going to act on it. I'm going to live on it. And that's what he did. And let me tell you how powerful that was, that even when he was doing his pilgrimage and so forth, you know, he bought a, 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 a burial at the cave of Machpelah. And you watch this. You watch how the investment in, his, in the divine promises of God worked. Buried Sarah. But got a burial ground from himself there. And then you watch his son Jacob. Jacob wound up down in Egypt, and Jacob died in Egypt. But they carried Jacob's body back. I've got a ring in there, boys, or something. I don't know what it's doing. It may not be hitting you guys, I think, it's in these monitors. But, uh, but Jacob had them to take his body and bury it back there for in Canaan. Now, what was all that about? You know what they were making a statement with, even about their burial? that they were investing their whole life and their future and the future of their descendants in the promises of God about that land. They were making a statement by even where they were buried at. Then you take Joseph. Now watch this. You've got Abraham, Jacob, and then you come down to Joseph, one of the 12 tribes. You know what Joseph said to them? 
He said, God is going to deliver you. We've got a promise. He said, God is going to deliver this nation out of Egypt. He's, he's promised us a land. And he said, there's going to come a time when God is going to deliver you out of this land and take you back to that land that God has promised. And he said, when he does it, he said, take my bones with you. And did you know the children of Israel carried the bones of his coffin back to Canaan land with them? And what he's saying there, now listen, there's a deep running thing here about, about that we can grab hold of here that help us in our families and our lives and help our nation. Is that these people said, we've got something from God. God gave us a promise. God gave us a land. God gave us a life. God gave us a way of living. And we're going to invest in this thing. And we're not going to just say, well, it don't amount to anything. That's just, that's just paper on ink. That's just something God said. That's still got that ring in it, boys. I don't know what it is. But, uh, they said, listen, we really do believe this. And we're going to live in that light. And that's what they thought. And by the way, that's what you find out. Think about this. Moses, here's 400 and some years later, and had the opportunity, the Bible said, choosing rather to suffer the affliction of God's people, the affliction of God's people than the treasures in Egypt. And what he was doing, here Moses had an opportunity either to invest his life in Worldly money and fame and all the rest of it. Got to do something with that. Boys, it's just ringing at me like I don't know what it is. Turn that reverb down or something. It's just, I can't even preach for, for thinking about it. I'd rather have it off than, than like that. But, uh, but, he, but he realized that, listen, there's something that God has said. God has promised something. I'm going to invest my life in it. And that's what Moses did. Now, you just think about this. Moses could have been the king of, e- of Egypt. But he said, no, I'm going to invest my life in the promises of God. Now, what is that? That's faith. That's faith. When you can say, you know what, I don't care. It may not look like it's paying the story. How many, let me just get something down tonight. I want, I want to address this. It is easy to grow up in a church and in a Christian environment and hear the statement, it pays to serve God. And we tend to, if you kids, you young people listen to me, especially you young married couples, you young people listen to me. If you're not careful, Satan will take that and he'll twist that just a little bit on you. And he'll make you think, well, if I live right and do right and serve God, I'll just, you know, it's really going to pay me. You're not talking about the same currency. God's payment is not world's currency. They don't deal in the same currency. The world's currency is fool's gold. God's currency is eternal riches. It does pay to serve God. But not necessarily in material or time blessings. Now, I want to say this to you. I believe it does every way in the world. It pays to serve God. But I'm going to tell you the truth about it is, in the Old Testament, they were at serving God. Their reward was prosperity, and that's the truth. You check it out. Did you know what the New Testament church is? Persecution. And I think here's where the trap is. Young people, let's do good. I've li- literally, I have had to pull my leg out of this trap several times in the last 30 years. Because I had this subconscious idea that if I serve God and live for God, God's going to bless me. And if I serve God, there won't be any trouble, there won't be problems, there won't be trials of life. And that's just not true. Yea, all that shall live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. If there's anything the New Testament teaches, this light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding eternal weight of glory. And I think it's a mistake to teach our kids or to let our kids imply the sense, the sense that, well, you know, if you live for God, you know, God's just going to let you sit on this little tree and candy will fall off of it the rest of your life. It's not true. And what we've got to do is invest in the divine, have faith to understand, yes, it will pay to serve God, but not always in the world's currency. Not always in the way the world thinks of blessing. Not the way the world thinks of it, of, of it pain. Because I'll tell you what will happen to you. You'll serve God and do your best to serve God. And then wham, I mean something just hits you upside the head and your whole world's blown apart. And the devil then walks up and says, that's a lie. It doesn't pay to serve God, does it? Look at the facts on the ground. The facts are on the ground that you tried to serve Jesus Christ. You tried to do what was right. You tried to be faithful. Now look what's happening to you. And I'll tell you something, when it's in your face like that, it's another deal. So all of a sudden you've got to realize that, you know, maybe I better get my theology straightened up a little bit. 
Maybe living by faith doesn't mean everything's just going to be wonderful for me in my life. Let me tell you something. Christian people, it rains on the just and the unjust. The sun shines on the just and the unjust. Bad things happen to good people. Bad things happen to godly people. In fact, I'll tell you this much. Some of the most godly people I've ever known, I've seen some of the worst things happen to And if you're not careful, you just get this deal done. That's why I despise prosperity gospel. I literally despise it. It is killing this nation spiritually. It sets people up for failure. It makes them think that if I serve God, I'll get blessings and I'll get money. Then when it doesn't happen, whenever they, everything goes south and everything goes sour and didn't turn out like they thought, then, then they don't want to worship that God because that God failed them. They were worshiping the wrong God. That's why I said lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Set your affection on things above. And there needs to be a transfer. Now, it pays to serve God. Let me tell you something. The love and the joy and the peace and the assurance of salvation is more than we deserve. Amen. It's more than we deserve. And we're blessed. I like old trucker calls me up every once in a while and say, how you doing? He, uh, he'll tell me, how you doing, Kelly? And I'll say, better than I deserve. I'll say, how you doing? He said, too blessed to be stressed. Yeah. Amen. That's good. But you know what the truth about it is? There's sorrows that come your way. And I like what the old three Hebrew children, children told the king over there in Daniel. They said, our God is able to deliver us. But if he doesn't, we're still not bound. And you know what God didn't do? God did not deliver them. And there's some things that God's not going to deliver you from. He's going to deliver you through. And this is where faith comes in. I will never forget hearing a preacher say this illustration. It's so true. And I, I've seen things almost like it. He said he went in to see a dear sister at church that was sick in the hospital and diagnosed with terminal cancer. And he said he went in to see her. Normally said she was just so full of joy and so full of trust and so full of peace that he just, you know, he said it was a blessing to go see her. He said, I was the one that got blessed, not her. And here she's dying and here everything. And she's just, you know, got this peace of God that's unama- just amazing. He said one day I went in to see her and he said she, she just, she, her whole countenance, her whole spirit, everything was changed about her. And she just had this nervousness about her and, and this just, just totally different person. And he said, I, I said hello to her, and I shook her hand and said, how you doing? And she started weeping. She started trembling. She started shaking. Just, and he said, dear sister, what's wrong? And said she couldn't even speak. She was crying so bad. And she took her hand and pointed to the nightstand on, by the hospital bed to a little pamphlet that somebody brought to her. And he said, I picked it up, and in it, it was about faith to be healed. And this well-meaning person had written in longhand on their own writing at the bottom of this little pamphlet said, and if you have enough faith, you'll be healed. And she said, Pastor, I've called for the elders of the church. I've asked them to anoint me with oil. I've confessed my faults. I've done everything I know. And she said, I'm going to be honest with you, Pastor. I've had all the faith I know to have. I wanted God to heal me. I'd like to be healed, but you know, I... I just was accepting God's will for my life, but they're telling me that I don't have faith because I'm not healed. Pastor, is this true? And that wise old pastor, his name's Laverne Butler, said, I took that lady to Hebrews chapter 11. And he said, we read, by faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. And we read where Enoch, by faith, was translated that he should not see death. And we read... Abram, by faith, was called out of Ur Chaldees and so forth. And we read Enoch, by you know, and on and on. And we read Moses. And we read all those great faith heroes over there. And then he said, there was a little colon. And he said, and the Bible said, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. He said, the truth about it is, dear sister, that most people don't have the Red Sea open up for them. Most people don't see the sun stand still. Most people don't see the big miracles. They just have to live by faith that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. That's the real truth of it, folks. Let me tell you something. Tonight. Faith just believes God. Let me tell you, it takes more faith. And this is what he told her. He said it takes more faith to trust the Lord and to rest in the promise of rest in God when it doesn't seem like God's coming through than when it does. See, anybody can believe God when there's this great, 
great display of, of God's power and God's protection and God's provision in every issue of our life. But he said, when it looks like God's not coming through, can you still believe Him? And let me tell you this, when you followed that hearse to the cemetery and you prayed your eyes out, and when you could stand there and sit in that chair and the preacher saying little weak-watered words the best he can to try to comfort you, and there's people around you, but nobody knows the emptiness of your heart and the loneliness of your soul. And when you see them start lowering that vault, that, you, that casket down that vault, and when they start lowering that vault down in that six foot of ground, and you can still say, I just trust the Lord. When a mother or the father can see a little child that they've loved and birthed into this world, and you can see them go, and you can say, I still trust him. That's faith. Faith is not when you all of a sudden found out that you had an aunt that died and she left you $160,000. That don't take much faith, amen? I think any old drunk could, say, could accept that, don't you? But I'm saying it takes faith when everything's going bad, when everything's going south. For all of them, it was the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And I want to encourage this church to invest in the divine promises of God. Let me give you a promise that I've rested on for years. Fear not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee. I'll uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. And all they that are, uh, I can't even quote it now, that, against, that, that which are incensed against thee shall be ashamed and confounded, and they shall be as nothing. Let me give you a little illustration about faith this afternoon. And I, I say this in, 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 in just honesty, just tell you about the life, part of my little life of faith. Went up to do a wedding this afternoon, and there's quite a number of people there, and it's just a beautiful place, beautiful setting. And, and I was had my little, you know, you have a little wedding and funeral book they have, you know, with the vows and stuff in it. And I was sitting there in the chair waiting for the deal to start, and I was kind of going over the vows. And I'd never done this before in my life, and God spoke to my heart. He said, Reggie, I want you to stop in the middle of this service, and I want you to talk about how marriage is deteriorating in America, that it's an institution of God, and that where we're at and the definite, and shacking up and living together is destroying holy matrimony. And I'm like, Lord, I don't know all these people. <laughs> and God said, that's right. And that's good. And the devil said, well, there's allowed to be five or six guys out here shacking up with some gal they got with them here. Hey, I'll corner you over here at the corner of the house after the, after the wedding. You know, any of this stupid stuff like that, the devil, you know. But you know what? There's something comes over me every once in a while. It's just God's spirit. I just said, Lord, that's what you want. That's what we'll do. Here we go. You know what? This is really weird. I got up and, I, and just, Lord, just give me grace. And some of you were there, Sam, you were there and stuff. You know, I've never said that before in my life at a wedding, what I said there this evening. And Lord, just give me grace. And I just talked about the fact that marriage is being thrown in the ditch in this country. And we've got what we've got about all this same-sex garbage. Because people threw, let me tell you something, people, people threw marriage a long way, a long way before the queers got around here. And they decided they didn't need holy matrimony, they didn't need sacred matrimony. And what I'm saying to you is this, God a long time ago gave me a promise, fear not for I am with thee. Be not dismayed for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee. So when God tells me to do something like that in a place where I, you know, I have no idea what may occur, it's just that promise. I invest my life in that divine promise. You know what? The devil's the biggest liar in the world. Just the flip opposite happened. The grandpa, the bride, come up to me and he says, I've never heard that at a wedding in my life and I want to thank you so much for saying that. Another man come around from the back, just, I mean, just immediately after that, and come up to me and said, I'm from up around Lebanon, Missouri. And he said, I've been trying to get a men's prayer meeting together and get men together about just we've got to get this country back to God. And he said, I have never heard that in a wedding. He said, I'm so grateful to hear somebody say what needs to be said. You know what I'm telling you tonight? You listen to me. You're going to be a preacher. You better get some promises. You better get some promises. Let me give you another promise that I've lived on for years. Now unto him that's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. Do you know what that power is? And one aspect of that power is the power of faith. To believe God for great and mighty things. I'm honest with you. I Didn't I hear a while back tell you all about the time that B.R. Lakin laid hands on me? Didn't I tell you all that? I had never told that before in, in my life. But you know what God did with me in the first several months of preaching and, and the first couple of years of expecting? You know what? So, uh, oh, I heard a man say one time preaching. He said, young preachers are, 
or like wasps. He said they're the biggest when they're born. <laughs> and sometimes we are. But you know what? In all my, in all my heart, I wasn't on an ego trip. I just said, God, I'm not, I don't want to invest the rest of my life in the ministry without seeing your power. I'm not interested in just going through the motions or going to church Sunday after Sunday, year after year, thinking I just did my, you know, and just being as dead as last year, not seeing the power of God. And you know what I've asked God year after year after year after do? God said, it, Lord, would you do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask according to the power of the work of it? God, would you give me faith to believe that you can do things that I couldn't dream could be done? And let me tell you how God's answered that prayer. This morning when I read that email, you know, all I could think about was, God, you're doing exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Did you know this old book is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword? It's so pow- That name of Jesus is so powerful, the, uh, the Saudi Arabian government got one it on the Internet. <laughs> you know, if he didn't amount to anything, why don't let him go? Amen? If his name's going to have power in it, just let it go. It ain't going to hurt nobody. It's got power in it. And you go in faith in this word, you cannot believe what happened. You raise your kids in this word, you can't believe what will happen. I'm telling you something. You go out and go for God and you have faith and believe God. It's just amazing what God will do through faith and simple childlike faith. Well, got all that and I got to thinking about faith and I got to think about what faith was. And it's really bad for me to do this because now this morning, remember I told you I was halfway through my notes and so I'm trying to finish this message tonight, all right? And I come up with this morning 61 things faith is that starts with the letter P. Now, how'd y'all like me to preach that tonight? 61 point message. Well, here we go. It's going to be real fast. Because Peter said the faith is precious, right? So that's number one. So I said, well, let's see if we can't add to that a little bit. And I said, I thought to myself, faith is plenteous. There's plenty of faith to go around. You want to increase faith, it comes by hearing. And hearing comes by the Word of God. Somebody says, oh, but I'm so weak in faith. Read your Bible. Just, just start reading your Bible more and believe in God's Word and say, God, you know what the disciples said? Lord, increase our faith. Lord, increase our faith. Start praying. Say, God, help me to believe you for great and mighty things. I'm serious with you. I, no, no. Well, I can't do this and we'll never get done. Number three, faith is powerful. Amen. Faith will save you. That takes power. Amen. A faith can move mountains. That's power. Faith can just do. I mean, to tell you something, listen, faith is so amazing. It's just hard to get your mind around it. What faith can do. I mean, as, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. According to your faith, so be it. So I don't believe that can happen. It won't. It won't. But I tell you what God's waiting for is the person who will say, you know what, by God's grace, this is going to happen. I mean, I, it's the, to me, it's the most exciting life in the world is to live by faith. Four times the Bible said the just shall live by faith. And I'm telling you, it's powerful. Number four, faith palpates. You know what that means? You know what it means to palpate? Throb. Move. Live. Palpate means there's life there. Now listen, just go easy. Stay with me. I've been around cattle too long. A veterinarian palpates. Cows. You know what he's feeling for? Life. And did you know, you listen to me, there's truth to this. Faith has, has life in it. Faith palpates. I'm going to tell you something. I don't believe you can be saved and not something. Some, I believe if you get Jesus in you, something's going to come out of you. I believe if you've got living, saving faith inside you, something is just that life. Let me tell you something. You, there's, you touch that, there's life there. And I've seen veterinarians reach in there, and he feel that, yep, she's in the second stage. You know what he said? He felt life in there. You know what? I've tried to crack and check cow for it, and the calf starts sucking your hand. Ah, oh, you ain't liking this. Let's move on to the next one. <laughs> hey, man. hey, there's something in, alive inside. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Amen? I don't want no dead bunch of junk. Preacher came up here this morning and told me, he said, Reggie, I'll tell you, a dead church will steal your family, take them to hell. He said, don't ever let this church die. He said, if you have to throw the, if you have to throw the pulpit, wake everybody up, keep everybody rolling around here. Number five, faith protects. Let me tell you something, you can pray a hedge of protection around your family. Faith protects. Faith provides. I'm telling you something, by faith, you can see food come in the house. 
By faith, you can see the bills paid. By faith, you can see jobs come in. Let me tell you something. Right now, right now in this church, I have seen faith provide for people in this church. It provides. Faith pardons. Faith partakes of blessings. Faith partitions. It separates people. Faith participates in God's plan. Now, if I was a black preacher, we'd get in rhythm here. I'd go, faith partitions, and you'd say, amen. Amen. There you go. <laughs> and, and, the, and the organist would be, wah, wah, wah. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And we'd enjoy church. Amen. And you'd forget about it being late. And you'd forget about eating popcorn when you got home. Faith partitions. Wah, wah, wah. I'll have to play the piano and do the amen and then everything, won't I? <laughs> Faith is a passageway. Faith to heaven and glory and to the abundant life. Faith is a passion. It becomes the most important thing you'll ever have. Faith produces salvation and wisdom and purpose. Faith brings peace to the heart. Faith is patent. It's clear. It's evident. It's known. It's, it's, it's open. Faith is a pathway to glory. Faith is patient. It waits upon God. Faith is perceptive. It sees the future. Faith is, performs miracles in our lives. Faith perfumes the odors of God, the sweet odor of God in our life. Faith is a period of when you cannot see, but you believe anyway. Faith is perpetual because it's eternal. Faith is perplexing at times. You don't really understand. You just believe anyway. Faith is personal. Faith is perseverance. Faith is persuasive to others. Faith is a pilgrimage. Faith is plain. It's based upon the Word of God. Faith is pleasant to the believer. Faith is a pleasure forevermore. Faith is a pledge received from God. Faith is plotting day by day. Faith is plowing when the cold looking for a harvest. Faith is your pocketbook full of the promises of the riches of God. Faith is positive. It's sure. Faith is a possession of a field, of a city, of a mansion, of a home. Faith is possibilities, for with God all things are possible. All things are possible to him that believeth. Faith has the potential of changing your life and your history. Faith is power with God. Faith is practical, it's not presumption. Faith is prelude to the sight that we'll someday see. Faith is present, it's a gift, it's a present, it's the gift of God. Faith is prevailing against unbelief. Faith is primary to a Christian life. Faith, faith is the principle to victory. Faith is a priority to the child of God. Faith is a process that we increase and grow in. Faith is the procurer of all that God has for us. Faith is a profile that shows us the shape of our lives. Faith is the project that gives us, it projects, it gives us direction and it gives us purpose. Faith is a prohibitor from ungodly conduct. Faith is prolific because it brings production. Faith is prominent in the Christian life. Faith promotes us to glory. That's 55. Faith is the proof of our profession. Faith perpetuates. It brings peace with God. Faith prospers us in every way. Faith proves the Word of God. Faith is published by our deeds and words. Faith is passed on. To our children, if we really have it. I say to you tonight, I agree with Peter. Faith is precious. Amen? Amen. Let's stand and go home. Shock, shock. Go ahead, say it. Hallelujah, somebody. Glory to God. Reggie's getting right with God. He knows when to quit. <laughs> Amen. I'm going to tell you something. Now, I can't describe faith. But I will tell you that. That's just one, that's just one letter in the alphabet. I pray that we'll all realize how precious the faith is that God has given us. Don't throw a precious thing away like faith. You heard of the little girl, didn't you, down on the dock of the ocean. She had, her and her little brother had been digging stuff. 
And they had a little bucket there, and she was washing them, this, that, and the other. And she opened that thing up, and she saw a little deal in there, but didn't realize what it was. And she just thought, well, this is no good, and she threw it. And about the time it hit the air toward the water, she realized what she had thrown. And it was a pearl. Let me tell you something. A lot of us would like that. We've thrown away something precious. We don't realize it until after it's left our hand. Well, I'll tell you, faith is so precious. I'll be honest with you, this week, and I read the first verse of Second Peter chapter 1. I think, Lord, I, I debated, I discussed with the Lord. I said, where do you want me to go? He said, just move right on to the next book. And I read that precious faith, and I just sat there, and I just meditated on it. But precious faith. Somebody ought to write, write a song entitled Precious Faith. Lord, help us tonight to make our valleys full of ditches when there is no wind and no rain. Lord, to do what you tell us to do in spite of what people may say. God, help us to not stagger at the promises of God as Father Abraham did Lord, didn't over there. Lord, help us to follow him and not stagger. I pray, God, tonight that you help us to invest our lives in divine promises, knowing, Lord, that faith is the victory. Faith, Lord, is the victory. God, you said the just shall live by faith. Lord, help us to dig into this thing, to think about it, to meditate upon it, and to read your word and build into our soul and our spirit a life of genuine biblical faith that will stand the winds and the storms of this life, the floods and all the devil and hell itself can throw against us. God, may this people, may these families, may these homes, may these marriages, may these children be strong in faith. I pray it, God, in Jesus' name. Amen.